Well, it's good to be here this morning. So glad you're here. Um, if you've not um, uh, um, been um, a, a part of, I haven't been here on a regular basis, we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount together and just kind of unpacking that and, and just looking and listening to this, this landmark message that Jesus preached to his uh, his disciples. And what's interesting is in, Je- in Matthew chapter four, we see Jesus is with a large crowd, right? And then he pulls away and now he just has his disciples with him. And Jesus begins to lay out for them what it means to be a follower of Jesus, right? It's more than just the miracles and all the things that, that the crowd was following him for. Jesus kind of brings them back nice and close and we get in on this this intimate conversation between Jesus and his disciples. And if we were to try to use, if we were to use one word that that really defines what Jesus is saying thematically in the Sermon on the Mount, I think that word would be the word different. Different. Because this is ultimately what Jesus is saying to his disciples that day on the mountain. In fact, that's exactly what Jesus is saying to us today, that those who choose to follow the Lord live lives that are different than other people. My disciples, Jesus demonstrates, are different. We think differently. We don't think just for the moment. I, idealistically, right? We're, we're working on that, right? We're, we're on this journey towards Christ-likeness, right? None of us has arrived yet, so it's, we're, we're moving in that direction, and the way we move there is to learn and listen and apply what Jesus teaches. But Jesus' disciples are different. They think different. They, they respond differently, and, and we see Jesus lays that out for us in the Sermon on the Mount, that we, we don't respond like the world responds. We don't respond like we used to respond before we came to Christ. We view the law differently. As Jesus lays out for them earlier on in this sermon, that, that the, 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 view, the way we employ the law and view the law is different. We view, our other, we view ourselves differently. I'm not what I was, thank God. We view ourselves differently. I'm not better than anybody else. We view ourselves differently. We're not more spiritual, not better, not more loved, not more uh, finished than anybody else. We view ourselves as, as recipients of God's greatest gift of salvation, and we live our lives in response to what God freely gave to us. Different. We view God differently. We recognize that he's a God of love, and not a God that we need to fear, who's trying to squash us when we mess up, when we mess up. We view others differently, as Jesus lays out in this sermon. As we saw last week, we, we view anger differently. We view speaking about other people differently. We view murder differently, recognizing that it's more than an action. It's something that's taken place first in the person's heart. Jesus is laying out that my disciples are different. And we'll see in our text this morning that we view sexuality and the sanctity of marriage differently as well. The title of our message, my message this morning is simply this, four easy steps to being a homewrecker. Four easy, in the spirit of all the, uh, the, the social media marketing, right? The four easy steps to everything. So this morning is four easy steps to being a homewrecker. Isn't that everybody's goal? <laughs> Watch this. This is exactly how I started our message a few weeks back when addressing the men at our Pillars event. You know what just happened in that last 30 seconds? $90,000 
was just spent on it. 750,000 people just visited it. 40 million men regularly visit websites for it. 10% of men admit that they have an addiction to it. 68% of men and 50% and of pastors confess they visit it weekly online. The it that has plagued America and her churches is pornography. And it is the number one cause of divorce amongst Christian couples in America and, in my opinion, the number one thing that is holding the church from being what Christ empowers us to be. And Jesus has something to say about sexuality. Jesus has something to say about purity. Jesus has something to say about marriage. And it needs to be a topic in the church because it's a subject everywhere we look. Every social media stream, every advertising made on TV, every billboard we see, every conversation that seems to work its way spirals in that move, that moves in that direction. And the church needs to have something to say. And Jesus has something to say about that. And he deals with this in our text this morning as we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount. Let's pick up where we left off last week, Matthew chapter 5 and, and verse 27. Jesus said, you have heard what is, that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. What strong words that Jesus is laying out that day on the hill. As his disciples are learning what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And as we saw last week, like, like anger that leads to murder, Jesus is pointing out that adultery is not an act that takes place in the bedroom first. It's an act that takes place in the heart. Long before adultery takes place in the dark place of a bedroom, it takes place in the dark part, place of of one's heart. And just like we saw last week when it came to anger that, that led to murder, Jesus shows us a progression that leads to adultery. If you ever want to avoid getting caught up in an adulterous affair, then listen up this morning. If, 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 you, want, if you want to affair-proof your marriage, listen up this morning. If you're not interested in that, then listen up because your spouse really wants you to listen up and your kids want you to listen up and your grandkids want you to listen up and generations after you really need for you to listen up this morning. And I know this is an awkward conversation. But the reality is this is the world in which we live in that just so happens to be the text that we find ourselves today. If you want to be a home wrecker, and get caught up in an adulterous affair, I'm gonna provide for you four simple steps on how to destroy your family. Or not. You see, nobody, nobody just falls into sin when it comes to adultery. It wasn't like, adultery never just catches somebody by surprise, like I just did not see that coming. There's always some groundwork that's laid out prior to that action, that, that if you avoid these steps, you will protect yourself from getting caught up in an adulterous relationship that devastates your family. And so can, can we agree this morning that nobody just kind of falls into, us, into that kind of a trap? There are steps, there are decisions, there is, there is compromise that takes place long before the action. That if we will just learn to identify what those things are will avoid being a homewrecker. Watch the progression. 
Remember we looked at that last week, the progression that leads to murder, right? Likewise, we see a progression that leads to adultery. Jesus said, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Four easy steps to being a homewrecker. Number one, don't care about what you look at. It's only looking. Nobody gets hurt is the lie, is the lie from the pit of hell. It starts with the eyes. Not the, not the passing, unavoidable glance that acknowledges a person is present, but it is that second look that moves from looking at them to looking them over. You know which one that is. It's that second look. Like, did I just see what I thought I saw? It moves from looking at them to, to looking them over. And let me point out that this is not just for the men. The same principles apply regardless of whether you're a man or a woman. But usually, the reasons behind why a woman has an adulterous affair are different than why a man has an adulterous affair. Usually, a woman is starving for attention and affection. Usually because a man is looking elsewhere. But that's another whole subject for another whole day. However, not that I read the book, 50, gray, 50 Shades of Grey that hit the world by storm suggests that women are a lot more interested and caught up in pornography than anyone ever thought. And so certainly this may apply to you as well. But what Jesus addresses here is, is how adultery starts, and it starts, it starts with a look. It starts with the eyes. It's what you, it's what you choose to view. In person or on the internet where you think nobody's aware of what you're looking at. Can I tell you that, that what you constantly look at, you will eventually go after. What you constantly look at, you say, I will never do that. Yes, you will. Because there's going to be a time where the look isn't enough. And the fear of the consequence is going to become diluted because you've looked so much. What you constantly look at, you will eventually go after. A few weeks back, I shared with the men the epidemic that exists in the United States today, and the church is by no means exempt from this. Listen to some statistics. Over 40 million Americans are regular attenders or visitors to pornography sites. The average visit lasts six and a half minutes. There are around 42 million porn websites, which totals about 370 million pages of pornography. And it's growing, why? Well, because the porn industry's annual revenue is more than the National Football League, the NFL, more than the NBA, and more than Major League Baseball combined, the revenue. It's also more than the combined revenues of ABC, CBS, and NBC. You are up against a financial giant. 47% of families in the United States reported that pornography, pornography is a problem in their home. Pornography, uses incre pornography use increases marital infidelity by 300%. 11 is the average age that a child is first exposed to pornography. 11 years old. And by age 14, 94% of children have viewed a pornographic website. 76% of our young adults ages 18 to 24 old, those that would identify as Christians, actively seek out pornography, 76%. 71% of teens hide online behavior from their parents. Their parents are probably hiding it from them as well. 
68% of church-going men and over 50% of pastors view pornography on a regular basis. Explains why the church across our nation is so unhealthy. 55% of married men and 25% of married women say they watch pornography at least once per month. It's an epidemic in our country. And to, to think that that's not going to, to, to change and shift and, and, and to um, corrode the behavior of people in our culture is we're lying to ourselves. It's, it's poison. When something that you see with your eyes triggers a physical reaction to your body, that image is emblazoned on your mind forever. When something you see affects your body physically, that image is emblazoned on your mind forever. That's how people get addicted to pornography. When what you see with your eyes releases the same endorphins that an addict receives when they take a drug, that image never leaves you. You see the danger of a look. Job said, I have made a covenant with my eyes that I will not look upon lustfully upon a young woman. I have made a covenant with my eyes that I will not look lustfully upon a young woman. The first step in being a home wrecker is that look, is that second look. Jesus says, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Notice the progression here. There's the look, it starts with the eyes, then Jesus says, with lustful intent. It moves from the eyes to the mind. It's the look, is that second look. But the third look, the fourth look, the fifth look, the sixth look has now moved into the arena of the mind with lustful intent, which is the second step in being a home wrecker. Don't care about what you think about. If you want to be a home wrecker, then don't care what you think about. Because that which is seen lands in the mind when that happens, an entire new reality takes place. It's here that that fantasy begins to fill in what seeing lacks. Seeing eventually isn't enough. And it moves into the arena of the mind. And fantasy is employed and it begins to create different scenarios. I know we're in church. But what better place to expose this poison that's destroying families redefining and creating dysfunction in our young people and older people alike you see when what is seen with the eyes is entertained in the mind a new reality is birthed it's there that, that people start thinking I can do that I, I can get away with that. I can hook up with that. All of a sudden, the, it's like the person gets a cape on in their mind. And it begins to create scenarios. And the longer that lingers in the mind, all common sense is pushed aside and the awareness of consequences are no longer a fear. Because there are no consequences in fantasy world. In fantasy world, it's all about me and what I want and getting my needs met. And you rehearse that long enough in your mind. As that gets entertained in your mind, it eventually works its way down to the next step in being a home wrecker, 
which is the third of the easy steps. Here's what you do if you want to be a homewrecker. Don't care about what you entertain in your heart. Don't care about what you entertain in your heart. You see, once it gets to the heart, it's just a matter of time that the right or wrong circumstances present themselves. It's just a matter of time. And what is, what is inwardly taking place in the heart comes face to face with an opportunity. And it manifests itself in an action. When you've rehearsed something long enough with your eyes that it's gone into your mind and then you've saturated your thought process in such a way that you've, you've, you're entertaining it now in your heart, all that needs to take place is opportunity. And the opportunities will always present themselves. But do you see the steps that lead up to it? Nobody falls right then. It's the steps, the progression that lead up to that. Jesus teaches us that, that at the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, eventually what, what builds up on the inside of a person's heart is going to manifest itself into an action. We think that if it's on the inside, it's safe. That's what the Pharisees, that's why Jesus was, was such a phenomenal teacher. And he's completely um, just um, debunked the teaching of the Pharisees. The Pharisees were all about what's going on on the outside. And Jesus gets to the heart of the issue. He's like, it's not about what's going on the outside. That's the fruit of something that's going on on the inside. And the inside needs to be dealt with first so that the outside never becomes a reality. If you don't want to murder somebody, then don't entertain anger. And if you don't want to be caught up in an adulterous affair, don't entertain these thoughts in your mind and in your heart. Because eventually... It'll bring us to the fourth step. If you want to be a homewrecker, know that what's in your heart will eventually become, a uh, become an action. What's in your heart will eventually become an action. This is the theme upon which Jesus is preaching. He's saying, my, my, fo my followers are different. Those who want to follow, they're different. They, 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 they deal with what's going on in the inside so that they can be a reflection of my love and my life to the world on the outside. But if we're not dealing with what's going on on the inside, and we just try to be a minister on the outside to the world around us, you're just going to be a religious person that doesn't really have impact in the world around you. And eventually you're going to crash and burn. The disciples of Jesus are to concern themselves more with what's going on in the inside because that's what affects our actions on the outside. James teaches what I call the, the anatomy of sin in James chapter 1 and verse 13. He says this, Let no one say when he is tempted that I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself doesn't tempt anyone. Look at verse 14. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. James lays out the same progression for, uh, that Jesus lays out for us in the Sermon on the Mount. Look at the, possession, the, the progression here. He is Lord, right? Each one is, uh, is uh, each person is tempted how? When he is Lord. This has to do with what we see. It's appealing. It's what we go after. It's what made Samson go after Delilah. It's, it's what made David go after Bathsheba. It's what made our first parents, Adam and Eve, go after the fruit that looks so good. He is lured by what he sees. 
but it doesn't satisfy after a while. Then it moves into, he is his here, he is then enticed. What is that? That's now we're thinking about it. It's now taking place in our mind. What we've seen now moves its way into our mind. And when we, that stays there long enough, it becomes the desire. Where does desire come from? It comes from our hearts. And it moves from alluring to an enticement to a desire of our heart. And when desire is conceived in the heart, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. It's the anatomy of sin, the progression of sin. And Jesus is warning his disciples and every one of us as well to be careful what we entertain on the inside. Something else we see that's pretty interesting in this, in this passage here that, that I think is, 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 is um, very challenging. What Jesus is saying here, he, he's speaking of the man's consequences for committing adultery with another woman. Now, that might not sound like a, a big deal to you and me because in our culture, that, that, you know, whatever. But in Jesus' culture, that, that was something um, very profound because in Jesus' culture, committing the act of adultery wasn't the man's fault. It was the woman's fault. How do you feel about that, ladies? It wasn't the man's fault. It was, it was the woman's fault. You remember the story in John chapter 8 when they were trying to set Jesus up? They, they go and they grab this woman who's in the midst of an adulterous affair with another man. They drag her out of the bed, out of the house. They throw her at the feet of Jesus. And the religious leaders say to Jesus, we caught this woman in the very act. I don't need to describe what's going on here, right? In the very act of adultery. Now Moses' law says she should be stoned. Jesus, what do you say? Remember that story? And Jesus says, let him who's without sin cast the first stone. And one by one, they start to pull away. And then Jesus, in a way that only Jesus can, brings grace and dignity and says to this woman, who, where are your accusers? And she says, there is none. And then Jesus said, neither do I accuse you. Now go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. What's noticeably absent from this story is what happened to the man. It's kind of hard to be in an adulterous relationship by yourself. Wasn't he guilty? Why wasn't he thrown at the feet of Jesus? Didn't he do anything wrong? How did he just get off the hook? Wasn't he guilty? Wasn't, shouldn't he have been held accountable for his actions? Not according to the Pharisees. While there was an awareness that marriage was a sacred link between a husband and a wife, and while they knew that adultery was viewed as a great violation of that sacred bond, they taught that unconditional fidelity was demanded only of the wife. Wow. Isn't that crazy? Not the man's fault. This chauvinistic attitude was taught by the famous Roman philosopher Cato. He lived about 100 years before Jesus. Listen to this quote from him. This isn't my quote. This is this moron's quote. Listen to this. He says, if you take or catch your wife in adultery, you may freely kill her without a trial. But if you commit adultery or if another commits adultery with you, she has no right to raise a finger against you. This is the culture in which Jesus is teaching. This is the culture in which Jesus is addressing this situation. And now he, notice what he's doing here. He's not talking about the dangers of adultery with the women. He's dealing to the women. He's talking to the men. You see, in Jesus' day, Women were viewed as occasions for sin and were therefore judged to be dangerous to the devout man. Women were saw, seen as the cause for man's sin. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? 
that's so backwards, man is guilty for his own sin. However, ladies, we also, you also need to make sure that you're not put self, putting something out there that's inviting anybody to the table. I think there's a, there's a, there's a there is, while, while there is never, a man is 100% responsible for his own actions. That doesn't mean, ladies, that you don't need to think about what you're putting out there, how you're dressing, how men are going to react. I'm not a lady, so I can't say this from experience, but I got a feeling that ladies know how to get a second look. But that's our culture today. And what Jesus is addressing here is that you're not off the hook. It's not, it's not, it's not somebody else's fault if you commit adultery. Look what he says here in verse 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, better to cut it off and throw it away, better to enter into eternity with one of your members lost than your whole body go into hell. What Jesus is saying is, regardless of what's going on around you, you're responsible for your own actions. Now Jesus isn't, encouraging anyone to gouge out their eyes or cut off their hands. He's, he's using hyperbole to, to make a point of how serious we need to guard against this sinful action. Because the moment we think it's somebody else's fault, our guards go down because, hey, we're just victims. It's poor men, such victims. Come on. No, Jesus has said, man, if your right eye causes you to sin, you gouge it out, man. If your, right, if your hand causes you to sin, you cut it off. Because it's going to be you who stand before God and give account. And so, four easy steps to avoid being a homewrecker. Number one, watch what you look at. Watch what you look at. Remember they used to sing that song in... In Sunday school, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful, little eyes, what you see. We, like Job, must make a covenant with our eyes that we will not look upon that which defiles us. Watch what you look at. Number two, watch what you think about. Watch what you allow yourself to entertain in your mind. There's so much power that takes place in our own minds. As a man thinks, the scripture says, so is he. Someone said you can't stop a a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop them from making a nest there. And we live, we live in a time where there's, 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 there's so much going on that, that there's constantly thoughts that are being barraged at us. And you need to let them go right past you. What does that look like? I mean, how do we carry that out in, our, in, 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 in reality, in real time? How do I deal with that thought that's in my mind? Maybe it's a memory from the past. Maybe it's something you engaged in. Maybe it's something you looked at. What do you do when that mind, that picture in your mind cannot leave? When the moment that happens, the scripture says, Paul says to Corinthians, take captive every thought and bring it into subjection into the, into, into the, the truth of God's word. Into the mind of Christ. And so when that thought comes in, you stop it. And you say, no, I'm not going to go there. There needs to be such firmness in our no that there's no room for a maybe. And say, no, that's not who I am. I'm a redeemed child of God. I've been bought by the blood of Jesus. I am a new creation in Jesus Christ. The old stuff has passed away. The new, the, the all things have become new. And I start doing warfare with what's coming into my mind, until my mind aligns with truth. That's 
where the battle is won. Because if you don't do that, and you continue to think on that, it's going to trickle on down. And the way to avoid being a home record, number three, watch what you entertain in your heart. Man, if this is something that's the first thing on your mind, the last, and when, when you go to sleep and the first thing that's on your mind when you wake up and, and you kind of envision yourself here doing this and that with this or this person or that person, you're in grave danger. And can, can I tell you too that this goes beyond just sexual sin, by the way? Every, one, every sin has, has a progression to it. My husband doesn't treat me like that. Wow, look at how he treats her in church. Look how he treats her in church because everybody's so good in church, right? And we think that's the reality all the time. He doesn't treat me like that. We start looking at that and entertaining that. And then we start looking at what we got stuck with. And you start, now, now it's in your mind. And you're thinking, well, you know what? He doesn't do this. He used to say this. He used to go here. And what's going on? And now it's begun to move from my mind to my heart. And, 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 it moves, and the progression takes place, doesn't it? Relationally, sexually, spiritually, in every possible way. Where does it start? It starts with what we look at long enough, works its way into our mind, into our heart, and is carried out in actions. Watch what you entertain in your heart. And then number four, don't, don't put yourself in a place where opportunity is gonna prevent itself. Hey, listen, if you struggle with alcohol, don't hang out around a bar. It's common sense. If you struggle with pornography, don't surf the internet alone in the room. Common sense. Put yourself in a place where opportunity isn't going to present, uh, present itself. And you see, Jesus, he's, he's dealing with the heart, not the actions. The religious leaders dealt with the actions. That's why Jesus said to them, you guys are like beautifully painted um, um, tombstones with flowers and it looks so nice, but inside you're, you're full of dead man's bones. Looks so pretty on the outside, but inside. And eventually what's on the inside comes out on the outside. This ties in directly with what Jesus is saying in, in the next part of this passage, and I'm going to end it with this. He says in verse 31, look, he says, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Can I just say something to you? This passage isn't about the allowances for divorce. This passage is about the sanctity of marriage. This passage of scripture has wrongly been used as just the only check off to see if I'm allowed to have a divorce. That is not the focus of what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus is not, not highlighting divorce and remarriage. Jesus is highlighting the sanctity of marriage flowing from a conversation of purity that he just got done talking about. In those times, people would divorce for the stupidest of reasons. Just like today. But a lot of that divorce had to do with certainly the, the, the sexual promiscuity that the poor men were victims of, too. And the use of their wife sexually as they got older. Just exchange them in for somebody else. Just issue a certificate of divorce. Jesus is, Jesus is highlighting the sanctity of marriage here. Not the steps that gives you permission to divorce. He's highlighting purity and how that purity needs to flow into sanctity of marriage because when there's not purity, it moves into this next section of divorce. Now, I know I'm speaking to many people here and online who have been through the pain and struggle of divorce, and I know the danger of just touching on this 
I know I'm fine. I, I'm, I appear guilty of painting with a very broad brush. I know there are so many situations that are unique and, and circumstances that have been painful that I could never accomplish, I'd never address uh, in, in, in this uh, small amount of time that we have. But I would say this to you this morning, that if, that if that's been your story, if you've been through a painful divorce, and let me just remind you that your divorce or your parents' divorce or the fact that, 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 that over 50% of the marriages in our country end in divorce, all of that does not take away from God's design for marriage. Marriage is for a lifetime. God created and designed marriage between one man and one woman for a lifetime. People can redefine it all they want, but God, who does not change, does not redefine it. It's for a lifetime. And what Jesus is dealing with in this text is how purity in the heart creates an environment for a marriage to flourish in that sacred covenant. So your painful divorce doesn't take away from God's design for marriage. Also, your, your divorce doesn't define you. Your divorce doesn't define you. God defines you. Maybe you've been through the hardest of time, and many of you I know have. It doesn't define you. There's a reason why the rearview mirror is very small on the front and, and, the, and the windshield is very large, because we're intended to move forward, not to live in our past. Right? Don't let that thing define you. Move forward in Christ. Move forward uh, apart from the guilt and the shame and the pain and all that stuff. Find the help. Get the encouragement. You know, do all the necessary steps of grieving that are so appropriate. But just know that God is the one who defines you. And he loves you. And then let me just say this lastly. If you're thinking about divorce, don't... Don't get on the bandwagon with the rest of our culture. Seek out a biblical counselor who's not going to tell you that the grass is always greener on the other side because those who have been divorced would be the first ones to say, no, it's not. Get a biblical counselor and see what God has to say about your unique situation. Because sometimes the certificate of divorce is nothing more than just throwing gasoline on the fire hoping it's going to go out. There's hope, there's healing, there's freedom, there's grace, there's forgiveness, there's joy. And for you young ones and teenage ones and young adult ones and, and not any longer young adult ones that aren't married at the moment, let me, let me just, don't let culture dilute the beauty of marriage. It's a gift from God. It's a reflection of Christ and the church. And when marriage is, is, is worked on in the way God designed for it to be, two people committed to each other and committed to the Lord, man, it works. And there's nothing more fulfilling. Don't let culture define marriage for you. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that... Um, you, you would just allow these words to continue to challenge our hearts throughout the day, Father. I pray that, um, that Lord, we would, we would take note of that second look and we wouldn't go and we'd stop it right there. Lord, help us to examine our own hearts to see what we've been entertaining in our hearts and our minds and, and Lord, to, to avoid us from an action that's going to bring consequences that can change lives. Lord, I thank you that you, you present these truths in your words not to make us feel guilty and ashamed, but so that we'd experience freedom and forgiveness and hope and joy and wholeness, the life you've called us to live, a blessed life. We thank you for that, and we commit all these things into your hands. In Christ's name we pray, amen.